I love hearing about the Costa Rica trip and how there's a growing passion in our church, both locally and also globally, to love our neighbors and for outreach and to share God's love, and God keeps stirring that up. Uh, we are in a series right now called Shalom. It's a rich word, and it means God's peace. It also means God's fullness, his wholeness, his restoration. Turn to the person next to you and greet them by saying Shalom. And then turn the other direction and return the favor. That's right. When you say shalom, you're actually speaking a blessing. May God's peace be upon you. And the theme today is both pain and peace. It's really a day of healing that we would seek the Lord to come into the areas of pain in our life. And we also are going to do something today that we do a couple times during the year, and that's to have the elders available for prayer right after the message. And from James chapter 5 in the Bible, the elders take oil and anoint. There's nothing magical about the oil, but we do it in obedience following the Lord's command in Scripture. And the Bible says, if you're sick, if you need healing, come to the elders. Let them anoint you with oil and pray over you. So that's what we're going to do at the end of the message today. And uh, whether you come up or you don't come up, we're praying for God's healing today in our lives. Let's pray. God, thank you for this relationship we have with you through Jesus. And Jesus, we give you our praise today. God, we're often wounded and deeply Uh, We have pain every day, and we don't always know where to turn. And God, we thank you that you're a healer. We thank you that you care about us. We pray that we would know that even more today, how much you care about us. And God, we pray for you to heal today on many levels in our lives. We seek you through your word. We seek you through prayer. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and your healing power. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. In this series, we're studying the shalom of God, and there are so many different angles. We just have three weeks left, and each week is going to be a very different theme as we consider receiving and experiencing God's shalom. Every week in this series, we take a look at something Jesus said, one of his statements. In the New Testament today, we're going to be in John chapter 16, so you can turn in your Bible to John chapter 16, verse 33. There's a section where Jesus is talking, John chapters 14, 15, and 16. We are on the eve of his crucifixion. And verse 33, he's going to summarize everything he's been sharing with the disciples in this dear moment with them and the ones he loves. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus is talking about peace. In the New Testament, in the Greek, it's erene, and uh, here's the shalom of God. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I'm going to repeat it again. Jesus says in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I hope that you hear the contrast there. In the world you will have trouble. But Jesus says in me you will have peace. Peace. In the world, trouble. In me, peace. What a contrast. Jesus lays out our experiences. What's more difficult, to go through pain yourself or to watch a loved one go through something very painful? Jesus knows and anticipates that both are going to be happening, and yet he has this vibrancy. Even though he'll be appear to be defeated the next day, crucified the next day, he has this vibrancy in that moment. And it leads to the main point today. Let Jesus guide you through the disappointment and the trauma with a spirit of victory. Going through disappointment and trauma with a spirit of victory. It almost sounds insensitive, doesn't it? I mean, if you're going through disappointment and trauma and someone comes along who brings some vibrancy and some victory, you kind of want to push them away and say, I don't think so. There's some tension there. There's a balance there. Jesus does not minimize the pain that he's going to go through or they're going to go through. He doesn't limit or play games about the pain. And yet at the same time, there's a hope that's far greater than the pain that they're going to endure. So today we're going to walk through that balance and tension with three clarifying questions. And may this be helpful for all of us, including myself, in terms of processing pain. How are you processing the pain in your life right now? Pain can try to push you away from God. How are you processing and walking through the pain that you're experiencing? 
Here's three questions. The first one is, what trouble is the world delivering to you? The world delivers troubles. What is the trouble the world's delivering to you? In John chapter 16, Jesus starts in verse 1, and he says to the disciples, all this I have told you so that you will not go astray. He's warning them. When he says these things, it includes his warning because trouble's coming. And when trouble comes, a lot of people are going to want to go astray. But don't go astray when the trouble comes. He continues, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. It happened then, it happens today, 2,000 years later, that people kill Christians and think they're doing the service to God by killing Christians. The same thing has happened, intense persecution. Jesus continued in verse 20. He says to them, as again, he's warning them of the trouble in the world. He says, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. There'll be intense pain. He compares a woman in childbirth, but yet there's going to be a greater joy than the pain that you go through. And he adds this in chapter 16, verse 32. He says, A time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Jesus knew he was going to be abandoned while he was on the cross. He knew that the disciples would be intimidated that they would be scared, that they would be running away, and he would be all alone there. And I sometimes wonder if Jesus was homesick. Do you ever get homesick where you leave one place and you miss it? I wonder if he missed heaven and the closeness to the Father and who was there and the angels and the safety of heaven because now he's in the world and there's all kinds of trouble and he's going to have to walk through it as part of his faithfulness. Uh, we have a Savior who's well acquainted with sorrow. We don't worship a high priest who can't relate to our sufferings, but he suffered himself and he knows what suffering feels like. Dorothy Sayers says it this way, he has himself gone through the whole of human experience from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain in humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it was well worthwhile. It was worth it. Everything he went through was worth it. And he did it for you. He did it for us. People are going through pain, intense pain these days. There's a ministry called Hope Line, and it's just that. You can call to receive prayer, love, a conversation, counseling. Morgan called Hope Line. This was just after midnight. And when I think of Morgan, I think of pain relationally, pain emotionally, pain spiritually, the pain of when you know you've sinned and done wrong and then just carrying some of that guilt and shame. That was Morgan's situation. Hopeline received a call from Morgan. Morgan was living with so much shame and disgust. She had a terrible porn addiction and acted out on some of her fantasies, only to find they left her feeling used and emptier than before. In her mind, it was time to end it all, and Morgan had a very detailed plan and all the supplies needed to hang herself. For three hours, the Hope Coach showered Morgan with love and reasoned with her, sharing the message of hope that God forgives, that change can happen, and that new life is possible. At 3.15 in the Morgan, Morgan typed, Wow, sometimes I think God sends us heroes, and I think I found one tonight. Do you realize what you did? You saved me. And the Hope Coach said, it's God doing it through me. I've been praying for you as we're talking, and I've been thinking, what if this was my daughter someday? And then the Hope Coach prayed, Dear Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son Jesus to save us. I lift Morgan before your throne tonight. You know her very well. Thank you that you let me talk to her tonight. Now touch her and draw her to your side. I pray that you protect her 
including from herself. Help her understand how all her sin has been laid on Jesus and all she has to do is accept him, accept your love. Bring some good people into her life. Please give her a great new job and some good new friends. I ask that you help her with the porn problem as you have for so many other people. Allow Morgan to understand that no matter what she does, she can be clean and pure before you because of Jesus' blood. I pray that you get into into a good church where she can learn more about you. And thank you so much, Father, for everything. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you know how many people are in that kind of pain, even in the middle of the night, thinking, what do I do? What do I do with all this pain? What do I do with the pain? The Center of Disease Control and Protection in our country says that suicide has tripled since 1960. For people aged 10 to 24 years old, there's been a spike in the last decade of 70% increase in suicides. For young adults ages 18 to 25, overdosing on prescription drugs is up 400% in the last 20 years, four times as many. And for students grades 7 through 12 in our country, there are 5,400 daily attempts for suicide. 5,400 today in middle school and high school will try to take their lives because they're in so much pain and they don't know what to do with the pain. We need healing. There's so much pain in the sound. There's so much pain in Auburn, there's so much pain in our families. What do we do with the pain? It's sobering. There's a documentary video, Seattle is Dying, and it really covered the homelessness, the drug problems, the despair we have in our city. And people are trying to figure out, what do we do? What do we do? So often with pain, there's that rock, and then there's the ripples that come from it. And we have little phrases or words that we use to describe what's happened. Like, we might say divorce. For me personally, when my parents got divorced, yes, the word divorce was accurate, but the pain would last so long because I wanted so bad for my parents to come back together. I want our family to be as it was before. I wanted them to reconcile. I wanted healing. I didn't want this change, and yet it was out of my control. I think I overcompensated in life trying to over-control some things because part of it was a reaction because the thing that I lost, it was completely out of my control. A lot of people feel false guilt when their parents get divorced. But I would look around at other families, and sometimes I would be jealous. Resentment was a problem for me all the way through high school and bitterness towards my parents. I would say that I didn't really have any significant healing till at least 12 years after the divorce. But Jesus started to heal me, and I forgave my parents in reconciliation. But I just want to tell you what a long process it was of healing. And sometimes when we use words like rape, or racism, or sexism, or alcoholism. And we talk about those things. What we don't see or pay attention to is the decades it takes for healing and the depth of the pain involved. Sadly, some of these things happen in church. You know, when I read John chapter 9, my heart breaks for this young man who was blind, and now Jesus heals him, and he's just so excited about Jesus, and he wants to follow Jesus. But then you have these religious leaders who are criticizing him, and then they want to kick him out, and they don't know Jesus. And there's a lot of people in churches that do cruel things. And then in the sound right now, we have the second most de-churched in the entire nation. Do you know how many people have left church in so much pain and disappointment? And Jesus meets that blind man. But a lot of people don't reconnect, and they're on their own, and they're harassed and helpless, Jesus says, and the crowd's like a sheep without a shepherd, and they don't have the community and the family support around. Uh, When we think about pain in the Bible, I think of people who lost their loved ones. Ezekiel lost his wife. Anna lost her husband. But God met her there in the pain. God met her there. And when I think about uh, some of the people who were killed in the Bible, like Stephen and James, even in the darkest moments, Jesus met Stephen there. I want to tell you today, Jesus will meet you at your point of pain. Jesus will meet you where no one else can, and he'll bring his healing, and he'll bring his hope, and he'll bring his encouragement. There's two sayings that are common, but I think Jesus offers a different way. One common saying is that hurt people hurt people. And sadly, that plays out a lot of times. Someone who's hurt 
looks and continues the cycle and hurts other people. But it doesn't have to be that way. Another one is that hurt people hide from people. People who are hurt, they retreat, they build up their fortress and their walls, and they don't have close relationships anymore because they won't risk or trust again. And hurt people hide from people. But Jesus comes into that little false fortress, and Jesus brings healing, and it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, Jesus is the way. He is our healer. And I just want to say today so clearly, Jesus heals. I believe that. Do you believe that? Jesus heals. He heals emotionally, relationally, physically, spiritually. He brings shalom. Jesus heals. We gather together to meet with Jesus. He's here with us. He brings his healing power today. In him there is peace. In this world there is trouble. Well, what does it mean to overcome in a healthy way? When the world delivers up the trouble, what does it mean to really overcome? When Jesus says overcome, that word means to prevail, and it means to conquer. Peter knew the pain of his own failure. Peter was there, John chapter 16. He heard these words, when the trouble comes, don't go astray. But then the persecution came, and Peter denied Jesus three times. He did exactly what Jesus told him not to do. Do you ever have that feeling where you've just done exactly what Jesus told you not to do? And it weighed Peter down. Jesus comes to Peter. Jesus is straightforward. This is in John chapter 21. And Peter's going to receive healing from Jesus. Now, Jesus walks him through three times, just like there were three denials. Now he asked Peter three times, do you love me? And it was the third time, and this caught my attention and grabbed my heart this week. It was the third time in verse 17, the third time that Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And a lot of people stop there, but I want to continue. It's important what comes next. Verse 18, I tell you the truth, Jesus says. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. That's right. Peter was going to glorify Jesus in his death. He would be a martyr. And in that martyrdom, he's bringing glory to Jesus. But notice what Jesus is telling him. Peter, when you get older, you're going to be killed for your faith. Now, Peter's got a decision to make. Think about Peter's decision. Put yourself in his shoes. One option is that he could push away Jesus and he could go back to fishing. He could try to go back to life how it was before Jesus came on the scene. He could go back and say, you know what? I've done enough of the following Jesus stuff. I'm going to go back to what I like to do and what's comfortable and what feels safe. That's one option. The other option is to follow Jesus and be killed. Those are the only two options. Follow Jesus and be killed. Follow Jesus and lead and use his gifts and be courageous and lead so many people to Jesus, but be killed. Or just go back because ministry was tough. Just go back and do my own thing. That was the decision in the healing moment. Peter chose wisely. What I want to tell you today is don't let your pain kill your potential. Jesus wanted to heal Peter. He had a lot of pain. Don't let your pain kill your potential. Don't let your pain kill your passion. Don't let the pain that you've gone through in this world kill your passion for the Lord. Jesus restores Peter, and he refuels Peter. He recommissions Peter, and Peter's going to move forward. I think Peter had to make peace with his journey. Have you made peace with your journey? I mean, Peter had to look back, own that he made some terrible decisions, but then receive God's grace so he doesn't walk around with guilt and shame. Are you walking around with any guilt and shame? You don't have to. Receive God's grace. Make peace with your journey. And then he had to make peace with the journey that's coming up, the mistreatments that would be coming. Yes, there'd be a high price to pay for following Jesus, 
And maybe you're considering that today. There's a high price to pay in terms of following Jesus. Are you really going to go for it? And he had to come to peace that there will be that cost. And he says yes to that cost. I was looking at Martin Luther King Jr.'s Dr. King's life and just reading again how his house was bombed, how he was attacked on stage. In a different incident, he was stabbed. When he watched JFK's assassination clip, he turned to his wife and said, that's going to happen to me. We have a sick society. He could sense his death was coming, but he didn't back down. He continued to follow the Lord and move forward. Make peace with your journey. Make peace with what God is leading you to do, even if it costs you life. Don't let pain stop your calling. Pain is Shalom's greatest test. Do you have any unexpected pain you didn't see coming? Doctor's report, financial report. Do you have any undeserved pain? Someone's really mistreated you, misunderstood you. Do you have any unresolved pain? Someone won't reconcile. There's just not a clear answer yet. You're waiting. It's unresolved pain. Pain and shalom are not mutually exclusive. They can happen together. In fact, shalom is rugged. Shalom is not a wimpy word. Jesus is saying there's uninterrupted relationship and closeness with him, even in the middle of the pain. And a very important word in the Greek here is tharseo. Tharseo. Let's say that together. Tharseo. That means take heart, be of good courage. And uh, as he says this, uh, to, in essence, cheer up almost, only Jesus says this. Jesus will repeat this. Take courage, be of strong heart. He says it to the paralytic. Your sins are forgiven. Tharseo. Tharseo. He says it to the woman with the issue of blood, who's had the issue for over a decade. Your faith has made you well. Tharseo. Be of good courage. He says it as the disciples are looking out and he's walking on water and the disciples think it's a ghost and he says, no, Tharseo. Be of good courage. It is me. He says it to Paul after Paul's given witness and told his story in Jerusalem and now in prison he's going to go to Rome and Jesus stands next to him and says, Tharseo, just as you've testified about me in Jerusalem, testify about me in Rome. Tharseo is what God says to you. Intervenes at just the right time, says, take courage, be of good heart, be strong in the Lord, Tharseo. Overcoming is not stuffing, all right? It is not denial. Have you ever asked someone how they're doing? And they said, I'm fine. And you can just feel the lie coming out of their mouth. I'm fine. Not believable, but I'm fine. Wouldn't it be refreshing if they just said, I'm in massive denial? <laughs> I mean, at least that'd be honest, right? I'm just stuffing all kinds of pain. I'm not doing well. I'm, I'm just in massive denial. You'd be like, wow, thank you for telling me the truth. I mean, that'd be so refreshing compared to, I'm fine. It's not over-spiritualizing. Overcoming is not over-spiritualizing. There's a lot of people who have the right answers, and they'll just keep giving the right answer. Well, there's a whole story inside that's different. And it's not a hopelessness either. You know, I was looking at the most popular songs for funerals, and I was thinking about where's the hope. Okay, these are top ten songs for funerals, rock songs for funerals. Number nine Queen's song, Another One Bites the Dust. <laughs> At a funeral, that's the ninth most popular song. Are you kidding me? Where's the hope there? Number eight is Highway to Hell. Can you imagine playing that at a funeral? I mean, you're either mocking hell or, I don't know, glor glorying in hell. That, that just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, the number two song is Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell. And that's just the rock genre. When it comes to all musical genres, do you know what the number one song is in terms of funerals? Yeah, last night people guessed Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Uh, you've been, we've been hanging out with each other a long time. We think it's Amazing Grace. The number one song in funerals is Frank Sinatra, My Way. My way. Isn't that interesting to get to the end of your life? When I read the Bible, you know, it's pretty clear. Jesus says, not my will be done, but your will be done. Not my glory, but 
your glory. And to say, oh yeah, I'm doing everything my way, that's just the anthem of the world. It's like, I want to do, I want to do what makes me happy, I want to get more of it, I'm going to do it all my way, it's about me, did it my way. And yet Jesus says, take up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow me. And I thought, what a contrast. What's the song at the end of our days? There's great hope and victory through Jesus, but we need to look to the one who's overcome. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4 says this, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. That's to look to God and not just look, but also trust in the Lord. Uh, I've had a song this week as healing's been the theme. When I slow down, I just like to slow down and listen to a praise song. And I'll listen to it over and over and over again during the week, even if my, my family knows and they keep hearing it and they keep hearing me sing it or try to sing it. I don't have a great voice. But this week, there's this song, uh, Through It All, Through It All, Bethel Music, found it on YouTube, 67 million watches. And uh, predominantly, most of those are mine this week. So it started out like 12 million, and I got up to 67 million. But it leads into It Is Well. It is well with my soul. And, and you know that song. And uh, just drawing close to Jesus, looking to him, receiving healing. I encourage you to slow down. Look to Jesus. Trust him. Receive his healing. Go deep with the Lord. God does great things even in the middle of pain. In pain, people start a relationship with Jesus. Many do. In pain, many people return to Jesus with all their heart. And in pain, many people grow more with the Lord than they ever have before. More honest, more deep, and it's happening in the middle of the pain. Tim Keller gives us this perspective. He says, if we again ask the question, why does God allow evil and suffering to continue, and we look at the cross of Jesus, we still do not know what the answer is. However, we know what the answer isn't. It can't be that he doesn't love us. It can't be that he is indifferent or detached from our condition. God takes our misery and suffering so seriously that he was willing to take it on himself. Jesus is going to take it on. He's talking to the disciples. And in John 14, he says, I'm going to ask my father. My father will send the counselor, the Holy Spirit. And he says, I will return to you. Three things, and they're true in our lives. We look back and we realize our faith is based on fact. Jesus is risen. That's looking back. Presently, the Holy Spirit is in us. Jesus sent the counselor, the comforter. The Holy Spirit is in you if you put your trust in Jesus. And we look forward and Jesus will return. There's victory, there's victory, and there's victory in the middle of a world where there's a lot of trouble. We need to remain in Jesus. Leads to our last question. What does it look like to remain in Jesus? And I know that pain and remain do rhyme, and I think they go together. I think that pain is the cue to remind us to remain in the Lord. Like C.S. Lewis says, pain is the megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I think the more you have pain, the more reminders you have to remain. The deeper the pain, the deeper we need to remain. Pain is our cue to remain. Jesus gives an objective statement. I have overcome the world. And he brings it in the strongest, emphatic tone. I have overcome the world. In me, you will have peace. And his peace, inwardly, is stronger than anything the world throws at us. I believe that. The world in the pain tries to pull us away from God, but his peace is greater. His presence is greater. I wonder how convinced you are of Micah chapter 5, Verses 4 and 5. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Do you believe that for yourself? Are you receiving his shalom daily and deeply? And then do you believe that for other people, that Jesus is their peace I think following Jesus not only includes receiving his shalom, but also means going to the pain. That's right, going to the pain in this world and bringing the shalom of Jesus. Joseph Bailey had seven kids, three sons that died at a young age. There were two people that were well-intentioned, came to comfort him, his book, From the View of a Hearse. And he says the first one comes and talks a lot and gives a lot of answers. And he said he couldn't wait 
for the first one to leave. And the second one came and just listened and prayed and mourned. And he said, I couldn't bear the thought of the second one leaving. One came to talk and give answers. Couldn't wait for that one to leave. The other one came to enter into the pain and to cry and to pray, and I didn't want that one to leave. How are you entering into people's pain? What kind of comfort do you bring? I think it's one of the most important roles for parents and grandparents to teach kids how to walk through pain. Do your kids and grandkids know how to walk through pain with God, how to walk through that? That's a really important life lesson that we can help them with, the shalom of God. You know, Paul went to places like Antioch. He risked his life to go back and see people, share his faith, help new Christians, help churches get established. He wrote letters. That's what we have in the New Testament. He wrote letters. But he knew more than letters were needed. So he went in person and face-to-face, and he would risk his life to go to these places. Texting and emailing is good. It has its place. But it doesn't replace face-to-face. And Paul would go face-to-face, and he would bring the peace and encouragement. He would enter into their pain. It was intense being a Christian in the early church, but he would enter into that pain, and you know what? He wouldn't just give the sermon. He would be the sermon. This week, don't just give a sermon. Be the sermon. Be an instrument of God's healing as you remain in Jesus. It's a union, a union that goes beyond any location or situation. Uh, The disciples, they've never been through this kind of pain before, but Jesus brings his peace. As you look ahead the next five years, Just like the disciples, the mountains might be higher than you ever anticipated, and the valleys might be much lower than you expect. That was the disciples' story. But Jesus would continue to be with them on this journey, bringing them peace, wouldn't leave them or forsake them. C.S. Lewis gives this eternal perspective. He says, They say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into a glory. Uh, as, As we prepare now for a time of prayer and receiving healing from the Lord, Jesus says he's overcome this world, and Jesus says he will do the same in our lives as well. He will bring his peace and help us overcome. The elders are going to be over to my right during these next two songs, and I encourage you to make your way over. It's not strange, it's biblical to come over and receive prayer for the pain that you're going through. And you can pray alone during these songs. You can pray with the person sitting next to you if you feel comfortable doing that, or you can sing and praise the Lord. Let's worship God together as we pray. God, thank you for uh, meeting us here today, meeting us at the point of pain. God, forgive us for denial. Forgive us for just trying to be over-spiritual. Jesus, we want to open up our hearts and our lives to you and receive your healing today. We want to draw near to you. You're our peace. And we pray, Jesus, that you would bring peace and healing as we seek you together. We pray in your name. Amen.